let's understand what bone cancer is to start with. It is it begins in any bone in the body but commonly affects the pelvis or the long bones in the arms and legs. Bone cancer is rare with some types of bone cancer occurring primarily in children while others affect mostly the adults. Now osteosarcoma is the most common type of bone cancer and you might hear um, Esther talk about that, but also some of the symptoms associated with bone cancer are bone pain, swelling and tenderness near the affected area, weakened bone leading to fractures, fatigue, unintended weight loss. And when it comes to treatment, surgical removal is the most common treatment, but chemotherapy and radiation therapy also may be utilized. Now, the decision to use surgery, chemotherapy, or radi radiation therapy is actually based on the type of bone cancer being treated. So, Esther, this has been your reality for a while. When were you diagnosed with bone cancer? Okay, thank you, uh, Gladys, for inviting me here. I'm really glad to be here to tell my story and give hope to those who, who, do, who does not have any hope. Mm -hmm. My sickness started in 2007. That is when I first had the word cancer. That time I was told it was called osteosarcoma. And uh, it has started on my shoulder mm -hmm. up to the muscle area. That is where I had a lot of pain. There was no swelling at that time. So we did some tests and I was told at that time it was osteosarcoma. After doing biopsy, the first biopsy, uh, the, the first biopsy we did also, also concluded that it was osteosarcoma, but we did, it, was, it was concluded that it was not inclu inclusive of so many other things. Mm -hmm. So I was told to do another biopsy, and then I did another one. It was called now chondrosarcoma. That is where I had chond chondrosarcoma. Okay, so 2007 is when you got the diagnosis and as we can see that uh, your right arm has now been amputated. How long did it take to that point? It was like seven years because mm. the arm was amputated in, in 2014. That is after doing radiotherapy and visiting so many other hospitals and seeking second opinions but at last I had to be removed my hand. The, the time that I was amputated, it was really swollen and I had no other choice but to remove it. It was removed up to the shoulder area. So the shoulder was, was there until 2019. Okay, and in 2019, what happened? I got another recurrence and uh, I thought it was because of the trauma I got by being hit by a door. Uh -huh. Then I went to the hospital, I, I was feeling some pain, and then after some tests, it was found that it had come back. Okay, so at this point they decided to now take uh, the whole shoulder? Yeah, I was told it was called um, third quarter amputation of the shoulder, uh -huh. and the collarbone, and the scapula. Okay. Yeah. All right. Now, Esther, it's been 14 years of surviving this cancer, and that's why you are part of the panel today, and we celebrate you because you give so much hope to others that Thank walk you. in these shoes. But let's be honest. When you got that diagnosis, what was the first thing on your mind? Oh, uh, at that time, I never knew about cancer. I've never heard about it. So it was a lot of denial, even from my family, mm -hmm. I remember my father telling me, this cannot be, our family does not have cancer. There is nothing like that in our family. So that doctor is very wrong. So we had to really uh, believe it and act on it because we had a lot of time to think and seek opinions, mm -hmm. but we had no other choice apart from accepting but it was a very hard time for me because I had a small kid and I knew he was only under one year, mm -hmm. my boy. So I was really afraid. I thought, this is it. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to be here to, for my son to be there for him. 
I was really shocked. But then after so many people telling me about it and talking about it and going to the hospitals, I found some hope and I started getting the treatment. We celebrate you. 14 years, meaning your son is 15 years now, right? He's almost 15. All right. Mm. There is a hope beyond a diagnosis. And I see Philip really shaking and smiling about that story. But Philip, she said the first thing was denial, denial, denial. Do you face this a lot with the patients and the caregivers? Yeah, first I just want to celebrate her uh, mm. as, as a hero uh, because those stories continue to give us hope. Mm. And it also makes people begin to see that, you know, cancer is not a death sentence. Mm. You know, you can have cancer, you can go through treatment, and you can live. Um, denial, uh, very common. And mostly when you look at her, you know, as she's saying, if she was a young child, you know, and then wondering where is this cancer coming from? So it's usually the first reaction that majority, not all, mm -hmm. majority of people go through, and mostly those who are younger because it's not something that you anticipate. None of us anticipate that we'll get cancer. So when it comes the first time, of course, there's that denial. Mm -hmm. yeah. And would this also point to the fact that there's a lot of ignorance about cancer as it is? Uh, I, I will not say so much because of ignorance. I think it's just the, the, the intrinsic fear mm -hmm. that people have. You know, when you're told that suddenly there's this big news, you know, and the first thing, the first human reaction is usually to deny. But of course, there's also a bit of, of, of ignorance because uh, if I was told like right now that Philip, you have lung cancer, the first thing I'll think of, no, 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 not right. You know, I have been eating right. Mm. We don't have family history of cancer in my family. And uh, you know, I've been exercising. So that's the first thing because you're thinking, oh, you know, those who have cancer maybe have not been living well, eating right and so forth. Most of these people actually live active lifestyles, uh -huh. but you find that then they get diagnosed. Okay. So that's why there's this denial and really struggle to face the reality of the diagnosis. Uh -huh. yeah. Now, as you know, we're celebrating our cancer heroes amongst us, and they are represented by some of those survivors in studio and at home today. So remember, the question of the day to you today is what more needs to be done to improve the quality of life for those fighting cancer? And you can reach us using those numbers at the bottom of your screen or write to us on that hashtag new normal. And uh, at this point, let me introduce the other survivor joining us this morning, Sydney who is a nasal cancer survivor 16 years on Sydney before we get to your journey let's understand a little bit about nasal cancer and nasal and sinus cancer effects affects the nasal cavity the space behind your nose and the sinuses small air filled cavities inside your nose cheekbones and your forehead and it's a rare type of cancer that most often affects men aged uh, over 40. now symptoms associated with this are a persistent blocked nose, which usually only affects one side, nosebleeds, a decreased sense of smell, mucus running from your nose, mucus draining to the back of your nose and throat. And these symptoms can be similar to more common, to more common and less serious conditions such as cold and sinusitis. And that actually speaks to a lot of misdiagnosis that comes with this cancer. Now, at a later, at a later stage, rather, symptoms can include pain or numbness in the face, particularly in the upper cheek, swollen glands in the neck, partial loss of vision or double vision, a bulging or persistently watering eye, pain of pressure or pressure in one ear, and a persistent lump or growth on your face, nose or roof of your mouth. The treatment that is associated to this type of cancer is a treatment recommended. Of course, this depends on how far your cancer has uh, developed and when it was diagnosed and surgery, radiotherapy and chemotherapy are mostly the treatment plans for most of the patients. So, uh, Sydney, what was your journey? When were you diagnosed? Uh, good morning, Gladys, and thank you for having me on the show. Caribou. I was diagnosed with cancer of the post-nasal space in February 2004. I had just finished my A-levels and I was about to go to university. And then I started uh, exhibiting some of the symptoms that you were talking about. Uh, flu symptoms, nose bleeding, and uh, very mild headaches. Mm -hmm. But with time, the symptoms got worse. 
and um, what, what was happening, it was actually starting to block my hearing passage, so I started losing my hearing. And that's when I decided to go and uh, find out what was wrong with me. So I went to see a couple of doctors. There was misdiagnosis. I saw doctors in different hospitals, about five or six different hospitals. And it took about six months to get the right diagnosis. Okay, and how bad did the symptoms get to? Um, initially, as I said, it was very mild headaches that you don't even think about. Uh, flu symptoms, which you just brush off, self-medicate. And um, the nose bleeding was maybe once a month. Uh -huh. But with time, the headaches got more severe and the nose bleeding got more frequent. But even with all that, I still didn't think there was something more serious until I started losing my hearing. Oh, wow. So at the point of diagnosis, what did the doctor said would be probable as the treatment plan? Um, after doing the biopsy and they found out it was cancer of the post-nasal space, uh, because of where the growth was, surgery was not an option because they would literally have to split my skull in half to get to where it was. Oh. So I started with radiotherapy. Uh, I did that for about uh, five, six months. Then I went on to chemotherapy. Okay, and uh, at what point did we totally shrink the cancerous cells? Um, initially, when I started with the radiotherapy, they wanted to shrink it to a point where chemotherapy would be more effective. Mm -hmm. So radiotherapy is like going in, it's almost like getting an x-ray. So I'd go in Monday to Friday. Um, it's an outpatient procedure, about a 20 minute procedure. And I did that every week for about uh, five, six months. Mm -hmm. And then when I did my test, they said it was small enough now to attack with chemotherapy which is where they give you drugs through the veins. Mm -hmm. So they stick in an IV and uh, they give you the chemotherapy drugs and they also attack the, the cancer. Okay, so when did you get the prognosis that you were cancer-free? Um, how they do chemotherapy, they do it in bouts. So I'll be admitted Monday to Thursday then I rest for three weeks because the drugs are so toxic that if they keep giving them to you, they can poison you. Mm -hmm. So after each bout, which is about a month, including the recovery, I would go in and do more tests to see if my body was strong enough to go through the next round of chemotherapy. Mm -hmm. So I was scheduled to do six of those. So after the fifth bout, which is about five months in, I did my three week rest and then I was, uh, I, I was um, going to do my test to see whether I was strong enough. And at that point, they told me there's no trace of the cancer. Oh, wow. Wow. So, so it, uh -huh. from beginning to end, yeah. my treatment took about um, seven, eight months. Oh, wow. That is very encouraging. So it's been 16 years later again. We celebrate you for bringing such hope to many others and, of course, being the cancer hero you are. But at the point of diagnosis, when you were told the news, what was your first reaction? Um, I think at first I was shocked. And I kind of like don't remember anything else that happened that day. From the time you said you have cancer, Immediately, I started thinking of my family. Uh, I was there with my dad, and he was very worried. I had never seen him look that vulnerable. And I thought to myself, this is my dad, who has been a pillar of strength all my life. And then I thought about my five sisters and my mother at home. And I said, you know, no matter what happens to me, I have to be strong. Even if it's not for myself, I have to be strong for my family. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I, I, I celebrate the fact that, first of all, you agreed to join us in this conversation because men don't like talking about their health, the journey of whatever kind, but also the fact that men also have a hard time seeking support, especially yeah. psychosocial support. Yeah. Talk about that. 
Yeah, um, again, uh, Sydney, uh, we, we celebrate you. Good job. Um, uh, actually, it's, it's, he, he does an amazing job uh, with the organization that he works with. Um, men not seeking psychosocial support or psychological support is, is, is basically a cultural issue. Mm. Uh, because, you know, men, we are told uh, you have to man up and, 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 and go through this, you know. But the fact that he is out here to speak about it, just to share, it's very important. It's the way we've been uh, culturally, you know, brought up that we know we can't share our emotions, we can't share uh, what we are going through. We have to really figure it out, uh, find a way of figuring it out. Mm -hmm. But things are changing. Mm -hmm. uh, men are, are coming out, they are yes. speaking. Uh, there's a group that I, I, I lead at Faraja for men who have prostate cancer. Uh -huh. And you know, now those are our dads, you know, there was mm -hmm. this. But they come there, they talk, they share their experiences, and then you see them opening up. And we've been having them coming there for the last 10 years. Uh -huh. Aha. Yeah. And somebody is asking, if you were to compare men and women when it comes to denial when they get that fast diagnosis, who will stand out more for you? Of course, definitely men. <laughs> 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 the okay. men, the yeah. men will be the first ones. No, this can't be, you know, no, this is not true. This is not right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Women okay. will deny, but then after some time, uh, they, they'll kind of like accept because also they have wider social support. Uh -huh. Yes, yeah, yeah. All right, so now let's bring in the other survivor amongst us. And uh, her name is Jane Frances Angelia. She is a triple negative breast cancer survivor seven years on. But before we get to hear her journey, let's uh, look at what triple negative breast cancer is in the first place. It is a type of breast cancer whose name is derived from the fact that the cancer cells don't have estrogen, progesterone receptors, and the protein heart two, hence the cells <coughs> test negative on all the three tests. Now this differs from other types of invasive breast cancer in that they grow and spread faster, have limited treatment options, and, are, and have a worse prognosis or outcome. Now symptoms associated with um, this cancer is breast skin changes such as redness, swelling or pitting, like an orange peel texture, a change in the size or shape of one or both breasts, breast asymmetry, changes in the appearance of one or both nipples such as flaking or peeling, nipple skin, nipple discharge other than breast milk, breast pain, warmth, irritation, itchiness or even hardness. Now, when it comes to treatment of the same, it has fewer treatment options than other types of invasive breast cancer due to the lack of estrogen or progesterone receptors or enough of the heart to protein to make hormone therapy or targeted drugs work. Well, Jane, seven years later, we celebrate you. How was or what led to the diagnosis? Uh, mine was itching under the armpit, ah. the left side. So I didn't know that even um, I had a lump. For a long time, like two years, I kept itching. I would change the blouses, the nylon ones. I stopped buying mitumba. And you know mitumba are some of the best clothes because you can't get the same. <laughs> but uh, when I started itching, I started believing that some of them have issues. So I changed. But it didn't stop. <clears throat> until my, <coughs> sorry, diagnosis in 2014 April, when they discovered, uh, I went to see uh, a surgeon in Aga Khan, and they discovered a lump under my breast. But I had just been checking those lumps, but not finding anything. So for me, it was itching. The lump was found much later, and then it was hidden under the breast. Okay. <coughs> and at this point, when they tell you this diagnosis, what are you thinking? Death. <clears> How <throat> it was actually discovered at stage 3B. Okay. And <clears throat> I had heard that when cancer is in stage 3 or 4, mm. it's, you start preparing for death. So I started shutting down everything I was doing. I was uh, studying. I was lecturing. I stopped lecturing. But also that was also a recommendation from my oncologist. Because he said triple negative, as you have said, mm. it's very, <clears throat> it's a rare cancer. It's less than like maybe 10% of women who get it. And those who are diagnosed rarely survive, uh, especially the first two years. So he told me if I stop really rushing, uh, you know, the rat race that we are used to, 
and take life easy and he does his best he will treat and then i leave the, the rest to god to do the healing so he advised that i take five year leave of absence from my lecturing and my phd studies i was halfway and then i had to stop also my side hustles i had furnished apartments so the first thing i did is to close them down sell everything Thank God, I, because of social media and WhatsApp, I posted and my classmates bought and everything. And everybody was so supportive, so I got the initial cash to start my chemotherapy. Because I was told on a Tuesday, and the doctor said, I start on Friday. You know, it was a matter of really running. You know, I've never l ran so fast in my life, you know. Mm -hmm. I, I, I call it a race against time. He said, if we don't start chemo on Friday, and that was Tuesday, the cancer will reach stage four, and there is nothing he would do for me. Oh, wow. So it was scaring, yes. Yes, and you say definitely the first thought was death. And then, of course, you're being told time is not on your side. What are the family members going through at this point? At the time I was diagnosed, everybody was shocked. I had just lost my father the year before to prostate in December. Mm -hmm. And then I was diagnosed in 2014. And of course, my mother, I'm the firstborn, and you can imagine the tie, the binding tie that's there between a mother and the firstborn. Mm. So she was very supportive. She was actually the one encouraging me, close my house, Nin, do everything. And actually, she told me to go back home. So she actually took care of me, and I really felt loved and like I was a baby. And I think that's one of the things that... Uh, helped me to survive because you know uh, when you do through chemo or radio there are so many bad symptoms nausea you know vomiting and you, when you like you are alone or you don't have a good caregiver yeah. so you give up because nobody's pushing you you know eat or do this or go to hospital even especially during radiotherapy i'm light skinned so by the fifth session my all my skin was broken uh, you know it was all wounds because you know they map and they did from my neck uh, they did the neck all the way down, mm -hmm. and all of it was broken. So I, I used to refuse to go, and my doctor come and will call me, JF, where are you? Please, your session. But, you know, I was, it was really uh, uh, stressful. Okay. But thank God I managed the 30 sessions as well. And we celebrate you, Jane, seven years on and giving so much hope to many others that walk in your shoes and are facing other forms of cancer. And uh, Philip, just listening to her, you can imagine having a family member who succumbed to cancer. Then you're given this diagnosis. Of course, yeah. the first thought is, I'm going to die. Yeah, definitely. And, and again, Jane, I celebrate you. We say in the, if we militarize the cancer fight, <laughs> Jen will be a general <laughs> because I know, I know what she does and how she's fought. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's, it's true. If you find out that maybe a family member had died before, so of course the first thing, the narrative that you have is this is a deadly disease. And more so for triple negative uh, breast cancer. Mm -hmm. Not many people survive it. So there's a few uh, miracles like Jen. Mm. And I think it's encouraging. Uh, that's why we have her here. It's encouraging even for others who might be diagnosed with uh, triple negative breast cancer after Jen to know that, you know what, even with a triple negative, uh, no matter how uh, you know, serious it can be, I can be able to survive. But there's something else Jen mentioned mm. about stress. Yes. Very, very important. You know, as, as she's saying, the doctor, uh, encouraged her to take a leave because there's a stress there's a bit of uh, relationship actually there are studies that have shown that stress can, can impact your cancer treatment and post-treatment so it's something that i think we need to look into more mm -hmm. uh, and uh, that's why she was encouraged that you need to take it easy uh, so that you can be able to go through this treatment and then of course after treatment have you come across patients who have been insistent that they need to keep at what it is they do on a daily to feel useful or at least hang on to something and they still had a positive outcome? Definitely. So again, individuals are different. Yeah. People are different. Um, I remember there's, uh, there's a couple of, actually a couple of uh, patients that I've worked with who insist they get their chemo and then of course after chemo, uh, two, uh, one week after chemo, they go to work. Those who are doing their radiation, they come for radiation, they do their radiotherapy uh, treatment and then when they are done, they go to work. Why is that so? Uh, because they don't want to disconnect from work. Work gives you meaning. Work gives some people identity. Mm -hmm. And work makes you to be distracted from the treatment. 
So you don't focus so much on the disease, you focus on work. Mm. And then you find that some of these people easily transition back to work rather than taking off and then trying to get back to work and everyone is asking, where is so-and-so, mm. you know, where do, how are you doing, are you okay? And those are questions that many survivors struggle with after coming from treatment and readjusting to work. Uh -huh. Because they're just normal, I'm okay, I'm, I'm, I'm still Jane, I'm still uh, John, you know, I'm still the person. Okay. Yeah. All right. Remember, we are trying to understand from you, from your experience, from those you've seen go, on, go through this journey of cancer, what more needs to be done to improve the quality of life for those that are fighting cancer. And that hashtag is new normal on our social media handles. We have some of your feedback here. Victor Quenas, who says there needs to be a healthcare system that caters for chronic ailments free of charge. Tax collected should facilitate this. Victor, thank you for writing in. And I see them nodding. Cecil Ndongo says treatment should be made free of charge. Another one also saying the same thing. Mabwa Obura says a lot, especially from the government. In fact, cancer should be declared a national disaster. So many families are going through a lot, taking care of loved ones who are suffering from cancer. It is so painful. How I wish our National Assembly or the Senate would be giving cancer and related diseases some attention in trying to find the solution or some aid to those families that have cancer patients. We hear you. Thank you for sharing. Isaac Kingori says the government should subsidize the cost of treatment and improve the quality of treatment. Another here from Frederick Nderito who says treatment should be a bit cheaper and nutritional information given to the patient free of charge. Frederick, you touch on a lot because nutrition is so important in this journey. Caroline Sawe says the treatment of cancer should be subsidized. Also NHIF should cover all the tests. The tests are so costly. Virginia Kimani says, making treatment free for all, train more doctors and equip more local hospitals with radio and chemo departments. Virginia, thank you for sharing with us. And definitely remember, we're taking more of your comments, even as we understand what more needs to be done to improve the quality of life for those fighting cancer. That hashtag is new normal. And you can also reach us using that number or those numbers at the bottom of your screen. And Winnie, I see you shaking your head because you know when it comes to treatment, cancer there it takes a dent not only on you but also your family members let's first focus on the impact of that treatment on your well-being what was your experience okay the first time I I was diagnosed with cancer it was a bit uh, shocking because of the financial burden mm -hmm. I remember I was telling my husband about the surgery and all that and the money was not there. We were really down. So it is really de devastating considering that you have a, a young child you have to take care of and you have a lot of, a lot of issues you have to deal with emotionally. Uh, you are questioning a lot of things. You don't know whether you are going to be there. You don't know whether other people are saying that you are, go you are not going to survive. Mm -hmm. So you are thinking maybe we are, we are doing this for nothing. So it's really devastating and I think a lot of support and moral support from uh, family and friends is really important. Okay, so when you were going through this, where did you get the money to go through the therapy that you needed? Did you have a fallback on NHIF, perhaps an insurance policy? Remember at that time there was no uh, NHIF for cancer. It was not covered by cans by NHIF, mm -hmm. so you have you had to pay from your own pocket in 2007 and 2008. Mm -hmm. So my husband had to go to Afghanistan, and that is where we got our money from. All the money that he was getting, we were using it for the treatment. Okay. Did uh, the fact that you did not have enough finances at that point delay starting treatment? Of course, it it, yeah, it, it did mm -hmm. because uh, you know people before we organize a harambe or a fundraising, mm -hmm. it takes a lot of time, and whether we do it, uh, it maybe it, we 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 would get uh, some cash, maybe it will not be enough, mm -hmm. so we had to find another option and other means to get the cash from. 
Uh -huh. And even as you were going through the treatment, at this point, what is going through your mind? Because the impact of the treatment is also very severe on the patient. Yeah, you know, I was a young mother and even hearing the word amputation, that you are going to lose your limb, mm. that is really something to deal with. And if you don't even have enough support, it, it could even uh, make you go crazy, you know, because you have a kid, you are wondering how am I going to adapt to this life without a hand? It was my right arm, the one I was using. Mm -hmm. I was doing some business, so I really took time even to accept that I'm going to live without my arm. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Yeah. And at what point did you seek psychosocial support? I could say that at that time, I didn't even know that any, any organization or any support group, mm -hmm. I was alone. The whole time, I didn't even have any anybody to tell me about cancer or how to deal with it. I was dealing, it, dealing with it on my own, with my own family. So it was really a hard time for me. But I think because of seeing my kid and my husband, the way he was trying, I had to accept and even give my, myself some hope and mm. fight it. Mm -hmm. mm. We hear you, Christine. And uh, I'm wondering, Sydney, do you relate to what uh, Christine is saying or was your journey different? I relate with a lot of the things that she's talking about. I also work with an organization called Hope for Cancer Kids and we raise funds to support kids who are going through cancer. Mm -hmm. One of the biggest issues is lack of finances, even when it comes to diagnosis. A lot of people cannot afford the, the tests and even once they are diagnosed, they cannot afford the treatment. Mm. NHIF luckily nowadays covers a bulk of the treatment but a lot of people still have to travel to Nairobi, to public hospitals like Kenyatta National Hospital mm -hmm. um, to receive comprehensive cancer treatment. So the psychosocial aspect is also very real. You find a lot of families splitting up. The mother becomes a caregiver. The father is up country with the rest of the children. There's a lot of stress in the family. Sometimes um, the husband abandons the wife because he's thinking now we have five other kids up country. What are you doing with that one? It's a lost cause. It's a gone case. Mm. You find also those that do manage to stick together. They are pushed into extreme poverty. You sell your land, you sell all your assets, you ask your family, you do fundraisers, and you reach a place, a point where you have no other options. And you actually abandon treatment. Cancer is a very lonely disease. Um, as much as I had a very strong um, network of people around me, my family, who were there to support me, they still couldn't understand what I was going through. You kind of go through it alone, even your doctor does not understand you. So you have to find some strength from deep down inside. I turned to God, and um, that was what got me through it. Uh, but there are some people who don't have any form of support, mm -hmm. whether it's formal or informal. And you actually have people who contemplate suicide because they think it's a death sentence. Um, as she said, a lot of people can actually go crazy. So what, what Faraja is doing and what Philip is doing at Faraja is very important because you need someone to kind of sit down with you and walk you through it. But more important for me is peer-to-peer -peer engagement. If I had been able to talk to someone who was my age who had gone through something similar, it would have helped me a lot because after, after my treatment, I started doing that. Um, people would invite me to talk to people who have cancer, mm -hmm. um, my age mates, my peers. And they told me that the impact on that, just giving them that hope, seeing someone who had gone through it and survived, gave them a lot of hope. So impacting even just one person is very satisfaction. It's very satisfactory. All right. Very well said. And yes, it goes a long way to give hope to many others. When you were going through treatment, I mean, it's been 16 years. How did you handle the finances? 
Uh, luckily for me, I had a family who was able to afford cancer, the cancer treatment. Okay. That doesn't mean that it was easy. Uh, assets were sold. Uh, it was very financial, financially burdening. Mm. But they pulled through and my family was able to support me. There are a lot of people who do not have that option. And they actually just abandon the treatment. Or by the time they get the money to have the treatment, the cancer is so far gone that not much can be done. Mm -hmm. So as, as a lot of people are commenting, NHIF is doing a lot, but a lot more needs to be done. Okay. The cost of medicine needs to go down. Mm -hmm. Psychosocial support needs to be included in the package. And also the diagnostic tests. Okay, we hear you and we'll delve further into that right after this short break and also hear from Jane Francis in as far as NHIF is concerned because I know as Philippi is saying, she is a very vocal uh, advocate when it comes to this because those who live this reality, as you've heard, the finances not only dent them but also their family members. We'll be right back. Weka Kolabo na Shell, Shinda Fuso FI is back and bigger. Weka Kolabo na Shell Fuels plus Shell Lubricants, Africa's Osho Pata Convenience Shop. To enter the draw, dial star 384 star 200 hash, enter the code from your voucher and follow the prompts. Terms and conditions apply. We all need to come together in a partnership to figure out you know, the best way to make awareness, access. It's the easiest, it's the fastest, and it's very flexible. It doesn't matter where you are. As long as you have access to internet, then you can access it. How do you get the upfront investment? to actually create these materials. And, and that's fundamentally time, it's equipment. Do join us on Monday at 4.30 p.m. on NTV Kenya for this conversation.
invest in the prime plots from Finca Properties Limited, Equator Gardens Nanyuki, a gated community ready for immediate development. We also have Konza Suburbs, a gated community within Konza Metropolis. For details, call us today. Finca Properties Limited, prime and affordable. Thank you for staying with your world. My name is Gladys Geshanja. Today we are taking time to celebrate the cancer survivors amongst us. We call them cancer heroes because battling this deadly disease is no mean fit. And uh, we are within the National Cancer Survivors Month and that's why we are dedicating this Monday to just celebrate them and also give hope for those that have found themselves in these shoes or have to give care to those going through this journey. And still helping us with this conversation, we have Philip Podio, who is a psycho-oncologist at the Faraja Cancer Support Trust. Also, Jane Francis Angalia, who is a triple negative breast cancer survivor, seven years on. Esther Nyambura Gita, who is a bone cancer survivor, 14 years on. And Sydney Chahonyo, who is a nasal cancer survivor, 16 years on. So yes, it is possible to beat this deadly disease. And there's so many out there who are living proof. And that's why we need to continually talk about it so that we can give more people hope. And speaking of which, before we went to break, we touched on the fact that finances are really, really, um, is really one of the things that is such, it takes us such a hard hit or patients have to take such a hard hit trying to put it together because it costs a lot. Now imagine you have a chronic illness, an already bad in some situation. Then with a little money in your pocket, you contribute to the National Health Insurance Fund so as to have a buffer for your recurring treatment trips to hospital. Then you get the bill and when the hospital seeks to process the NHIF contribution to your dismay, you get a no and the fund has rejected your request to pay part of your bill. Why? Well, let's hear it firsthand from a cancer survivor who spoke to Anita Nkonge, who in turn sought answers from the NHIF CEO. Margaret Waweru has been battling cancer for over 20 years. First diagnosed with breast cancer in 1997, various treatments have helped her significantly, as well as the National Hospital Insurance Fund, the NHIF, a fund she says she's been loyal to for years. I normally pay more than a month. Other times I pay annual, yeah, depending on how the pocket is. Um, like last year, I paid this year food up to 31st December 2021. But now there is this problem that occurred and uh, I'm supposed to undergo the seventh chemotherapy. The problem Margaret is referring to is a caveat that requires chronically ill patients to pay a two-year upfront premium payment, something that Margaret says she had no idea about. The information I got which beat my heart Remember, I received on a Saturday, <laughs> I received a no approval. I'm telling you, it wasn't easy for me. It wasn't at all. Being a contributor, being faithful, now no. What does that mean? That nobody's concerned about your life, you go die. And I wondered, why were we not told before? If you know in advance, you can plan yourself. But if you don't know, you just be stay there expectant. The CEO of the NHIF, Peter Camuno, says the caveat was created at the end of 2019 in a bid to deter default payers. The few that get requested to pay, um, uh, like a two year in advance, is number one, they require that heavy 
uh, uh, or costly uh, uh, prolonged treatment. And number two, they have had a history of defaulting over a prolonged period. Margaret's rejection, however, triggered her to reach out to her community networks that helped her get an appeal. The NHIF eventually paid 25,000 Kenyan shillings, but she's still left with a lump sum to pay. Despite that, she says not many others may be as lucky as she has been. At times I ask myself, I have access to people like the, the Kenko, where I'm a member. What about that person who doesn't even know, who doesn't have the phone even to communicate? In my support group this year, we have lost two on the same lack of access to NHIF. So I think something has to be done. Things need to be kept in the light so that we know what do they expect us to do. The Ministry of Health say that they have put an elaborate policy framework in place to combat the country's disease burden, including decentralized treatment services and 10 chemotherapy units currently operational across various counties. In addition to these, the NHIF say that they have eased the burden for oncology treatment. Anita Nkonge, NTV. Margaret's story there told by Anita Konge is one that resonates with so many people who live with cancer or give care to those living with cancer. And uh, Jane in studio is a founder of the Cancer Information Support Network. And I'm sure this is something you have seen over and over again. Jane, what's your experience? Uh, my experience dates back to uh, 2014 when I started my treatment mm -hmm. and NHIF um, adamantly said they will not pay anything. Actually, I went to literally all hospitals, eh? Kijabe, KNH, all government hospitals, uh, hoping it would pay. But uh, as at that time, I think I was only told they can only pay for me radiotherapy, 500 per session. I don't know what I was to top up. But then, uh, it was 2014, I was told the, the um, radio, after surgery, I would have to wait two years to get the radio, you know? And so I said, now, if I have been told when you have surgery, then you need uh, radio and chemo, why would I wait for two years? Then I'll be dead, you know, considering triple negative. So anyway, to cut a long story short, NHIF did not pay for me a single cent except 7,000 out of 357,000 of my lump surgery mm -hmm. uh, in one of the private hospitals. That pained me so much because I have all my years of employment and before that must have been 20 years or 30, I always paid NHIF. My employers paid it. So I really felt bad that after all this, that is the only thing a national cover can give. Mm -hmm. And I vowed that when I get well, I will be an advocate and I'll lobby that uh, more people can access these at least in uh, government hospitals. So, and I remember my first program on TV, I started speaking about NHIF. Always, K20, everywhere I go, I always did. And so when I went back for some surgery in 2017, mm -hmm. you know, with you having beards, uh, swollen arms, lymphedemia. So every time it's chronic, eh? as Mama said, it's treatment that is ongoing. You know, you can't say that now I'm okay, I'll not do follow-ups and what have you. But in 2017, I was happy to get the fruits, and NHIF paid for me 80,000 of a major surgery that was uh, 300,000, and then again, another time it paid for me 40,000. But that is still minimal. I feel they can still do more, because there are so many paying, and very few that are getting sick. So that is still minimal, but uh, I applaud them for that. Uh, but then last year, when again COVID hit, yeah. um, we started a feeding program and assisted because many of our cancer patients had visited and realized many are struggling, many lost jobs, you know, uh, whoever, whatever they do, wherever they were working, the employers didn't want them because everybody's scared of COVID and everybody was working for their house. So um, we started feeding program also in partnership and sometimes we'd apply to COVID-19 relief fund and so forth. But when we meet the patients to give them 
the food. Would ask them, what other challenges are you having in this time of COVID? Because you know COVID is very, when you have cancer, then your immune is always most yes. compromised yes. and the risk was high. So they were telling us we can't afford NHIF, we don't have money, we've lost our jobs. And therefore we can't even go back for any kind of, any small treatment, you see. Okay. So I was celebrating 55 years this year. And because of my experience of last year, so many of them had suffered. I helped a few those we could with my friends. Uh, but then we realized the need was so much, the mm -hmm. applications, when they come, they would always feel. So we decided to help uh, to do a campaign, 55 at 55. So 55 patients to pay for them NHIF up to 2021, because they had been told two years up front. And I think that is too much to ask for. If this person is a Juakali or a Wanjiko who sells Kumawiki, where are they going to get 12,000 to pay up front? Yeah. They can't even put food on their table. True. So, but anyway, luckily we, we managed that campaign very well. And this year we've managed to pay uh, also with friends, support other friends, uh, Second Chances uh, Foundation and, and my friends. And we've managed to pay for over 100 cancer patients over and above the 55. But then mm -hmm. the needs are there, the applications are many. So I'd really request that NHIF um, finds a way, maybe through the universal health cover, and the new, uh, uh, I think the Treasury has also allocated quite some amount uh, for health that much more is put uh, for NHIF so that more patients, especially those that are most vulnerable, mm -hmm. can be able to access. When you go to some of these informal settlements, Kariobangi, Kangemi, because we visit, we have a visitation ministry. That's one of the things I decided to do from the day of my diagnosis. Mm -hmm. I thank God for my kabodi, so people never think, um, <laughs> you know, I'm sick. Eh? Even after chemo, after two, three days, I'll always leave a, a, get a phone call, because mm. uh, you, you media guys are very good, and people will call me ah oh, please i have a patient can you help so i go i visit we support but since okay. we couldn't support because of covid we've only been meeting them once in a while as a group in a big area uh-huh yes okay uh, yes. all right we hear you and definitely the challenges and philip i mean you're already living with a chronic ailment that somehow for some people feel like it's a death sentence hovering over your head then the pandemic hits and now you're dealing with two things for some it feels like double tragedy how have yeah. you been handling <clears throat> these cases it's been tough uh what what uh, jen is saying is true it's been tough for uh, the survivors uh, because again, you know, they were categorized under high risk group and majority actually uh, are, are, are struggling, you know, they're hustlers, you know, trying to make end meets and then you have to be out there in the open. So it's a challenge for many people and I think what Jen is doing is great. I think there's more uh, that can be done uh, in helping these people. Number one, helping the survivors. I think number one, NHIF, we talked a lot about finances, mm -hmm. financial uh, burden is a real burden for many uh, survivors. Mm -hmm. And like they've mentioned, they, they have to sell some of their uh, items, whether it's property, land, and things like that to raise funds. You have to constantly be calling uh, Harambees. And it reaches a point people are tired with seeing you because when they see you, they think of the next Harambe. So I think NHIF has, has uh, it's, it's done, uh, there's been some uh, adjustments, I can say, because I've been in this field for a while mm -hmm. and we've been supporting patients as Faraja, mm -hmm. financially supporting those who are not able to get uh, funds for the treatment. So since NHIF started covering for oncology, I think a lot of patients have been supported, but there's more <laughs> that can be done. I mm -hmm. think if we can come together and see how we can support them, uh, that can work. And then number two is, um, pandemic and cancer mm. there's a lot that we need to do and maybe if there's a way that the government can even have a policy that can really help survivors because some of the people are not going for treatment so there's treatment abandonment that uh, sydney talked about mm. because you don't have funds there's no jobs and it's not just the jobs people have lost their jobs uh, businesses are down and these people are affected so the government can come up with a with a, even a stopgap policy uh, that can help uh, some of the survivors uh, to find a way of how they can be supported financially. Mm -hmm. And I think NHIF also needs to be a bit humane uh, in the way uh, that they, 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 are, they are disbursing the funds. Mm -hmm. I know there's a lot of patients who are in need, but also we need to be humane the way we do it. Okay, and yeah. especially now that we know cancer is literally a race against time. Yes. 
Okay. Now, another thing that comes with living with cancer or fighting this uh, scourge is uh, the loss of income and opportunities. You've had the pandemic has exacerbated the same. Let me hear from Esther. What was your experience? Because now you said even your husband had to go to a foreign country to work to be able to support you in your treatment journey. And then again, there's the stigma that comes with uh, living with this condition. What's your experience? Okay, my husband has to be away from me. That, uh, that time was very tough for me because I had to be alone. Remember, I have a small kid mm. and I have to be there for him. I cannot work. The, the, uh, you know, the amputation was really uh, major. I had to stay in the house for a while. And also it comes with a pain that is called phantom pain. It, it is a lot yeah. to deal with. You have to stay uh, quite uh, distracted because of the pain. At, at that time, I didn't know there was any medication for the phantom pain. Mm -hmm. Now, the income part, I was, I was working at that time. I had a clothes shop in Kiambu, but I had to close it down because I had to deal with the sickness now. And remember, I also had to deal with uh, how people are looking at me. Mm -hmm. I have to face all these people. They are staring. I had to accept that now this is my situation and also to learn how to live with it. It mm -hmm. was really tough because now my husband was the sole provider in the home. Mm -hmm. It was really tough. Okay, now Esther, just listening to you, you know, I've had this over and over again for the patients I've talked to in different forums that say, when you live with cancer is when you know who your true friends are. Mm -hmm. Now you had to not only live with this condition, but also even lose a body part. So it yeah. is a permanent reminder of what this uh, disease took away from you. How mm -hmm. are people treating you now as an amputee? Uh, at that time, when I was amputated, I stayed in the house for a while because I, I didn't know how to face people. I was not, I didn't know even how to deal with it or even to explain to anybody. Nobody knew about my condition because we, we dealt with it alone as a family. So people were even shocked to see my picture on Facebook because I had to put my picture there, out there, so people can be prepared to see me now physically. Mm. So it was really tough, but I think my husband really helped me with the dealing with the situation because I was really confident. I didn't even care about people, how people were staring or how they were looking, mm -hmm. but I had to stay at home for a while to, to accept and really uh, heal and, and now start from there. Okay. And uh, Philip, I see you shaking your head because you recognize some of the things she's saying. First of all, what is phantom pain? Yeah, phantom pain is, is, is actually, they say it's an imaginary pain because you had pain before there. And then now, the, physically, you, you, you feel in your mind, it's actually a mental thing. Mm -hmm. In your mind, you feel that there's pain. And I've talked to a couple of patients uh, who the doctor, will, the oncologist will tell me, Philip, this patient is having phantom pain because we've given them medication. And, you know, at the moment, we don't need to put them on medication. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of therapy that will need to be able to help you uh, manage the phantom pain. But there's something else she's mentioning, you know, just the fact that you are missing a body part. Yes. And this is visible, it's physically visible. When you go out there, it's visible. So I think just the re realization that I'm going to go out there without a body part and people are going to ask me lots of questions, mm -hmm. what happened to you? And you get exhausted. You don't want to be explaining to everyone what you went through. So I think that's why she's saying she took longer mm -hmm. and she had to put her picture on Facebook mm. to desensitize uh -huh. people so they don't ask lots of questions. Mm -hmm. But of course, it's, it's really a major challenge. And I, again, that's one of the things that the government can do better. We have uh, people who have been treated like her. And uh, you know, she needs a prosthetic arm. This is something that the government, you know, can, can, can be able to cover like NHIF. There are those who have gone through mastectomy. So they need uh, prosthetic uh, breasts. And this really helps them. It will help her to have even a better quality of life. And she doesn't have to explain to people why the other arm is not there. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot that she can do. So I believe there's more that we can do mm -hmm. when we come together. And I think if we can be able to lobby, and that's where Kenya Network of Cancer Organizations can come in mm -hmm. and lobby the government. Can you include this in the cover? Sydney talked about the NHIF cover. It's helping some people, 
but there's more that they can do beyond the treatment and the diagnosis. There's what we call post-treatment survivorship. Mm -hmm. How are we able to help them address the issues of anxiety, address the issues of fatigue, uh, address sexual dysfunction issues for those who have prostate cancer? Because you've exhausted your finances. So if the government can come in and support in this way, I think it would be very helpful. Okay, and uh, Sydney, for you, definitely because you were dealing with a nasal cavity, perhaps there wasn't much to be seen in as far as your uh, process of treatment is concerned. But what, uh, what is your experience when it comes to perhaps loss of income, stigma around your treatment uh, season? Um, for me, as you said before, cancer is a very lonely journey. You, that's when you find out who your real friends are. I think I lost 90% of my friends. Mm. At some point, I started deleting all the numbers in my phone in December and only saving the numbers of people who actually called me. Um, so it became a very lonely journey. You are isolated from your friends. You are isolated from your family. You are isolated from society. And you just have to find strength somewhere inside you to keep moving forward. And it's, it, it, it's a tough thing, but at the end of the day, I was, I was able to get through it. Mm -hmm. And for me, some of the post-treatment post things that I've been going through, and number one, there was a time I was actually let go. I was actually fired from a job that I had. Because about 13 years after finishing treatment, uh, because of the chemotherapy medication and also because of the radiotherapy, I had a post-treatment uh, post effect of losing hearing. Uh -huh. So right now I have to wear a hearing aid to communicate. The hearing aid had to be imported and it took about, um, I think it was about two months for it to get to me. So at that point I can't hear very well. I'm insisting on going into the office because I want to show them, you know, I'm committed to this. I want to keep doing this. I want to pull my weight even if I can't answer calls or I can't really communicate in meetings. I can, you know, answer emails and do things like that. Eventually, I lost my job. Um, and it, it, it was tough. It was tough for me. But at the end of the day, I'm still here and I'm still standing. And we celebrate. And aside something. from that... Yeah. Mm -hmm. Aside from that, even now uh, with my hearing issues, I still have problems communicating in noisy environments or in public uh, because the hearing aid doesn't quite replace the ear. And that is another cost that I have to bear on my own because the government will not cover for my hearing aid. If I'm to lose my hearing completely, the government will not cover for you know sign language classes or anything like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, we keep pointing the finger at the government, but I also want to appeal to corporate, uh, corporate Kenya, people who have their finances to do CSR. This is where you can come in. We have been partnering with a lot of organizations to support uh, the kids that we support at Hope for Cancer Kids. Mm -hmm. Lions Club International. Um, we have the Kenya Hospice and Palliative Care Association. We have Hospice Care Kenya. These are people who have year in, year out, been there for us and allowed us to support the people who we do support. Even if you're not a corporate, as an individual, you can volunteer. There are so many organizations who are looking for someone to help them, give their time, give their expertise. Whether you're in IT, you can help you know, with website building and things like that. There are so many ways that you can get involved. Okay. Uh, you can do it financially or in kind and things like that. So I'll, I'll hand it over back to you, Gladys. All right. Thank you for shedding light on those parts of, uh, and actually the challenges, other challenges that come with living with this uh, deadly disease. And uh, before we take another short break, I'd like to hear from our viewers, even as we ask that question of the day, how or what else needs to be done to improve the quality of life for those fighting cancer? That hashtag is new normal. And of course, you can reach us using those numbers at the bottom of your screen. If you can have that, Meshak says, we salute the brave warriors who have braved and overcome this monster. As part of providing lasting relief to cancer patients, the government should have an annual allocation in its budget for this. We hear you and thank you. Elizabeth says, avail treatment facilities in...
all counties. Traveling to Nairobi is overwhelming for cancer patients. Elizabeth, we hear you. Thank you. Priscilla says Kenyatta University Referral Hospital is now there. Affordable and perfect. I'm on my treatment there. Feeling great after six chemos. Thanks, Dr. Moki and Dr. Gatua. Priscilla, thank you for that. Elizabeth Garanja says early detection is not all is not always possible because many facilities in the country don't offer cancer screening and majority cannot afford it anyway. Elizabeth Asante Gatwiri here says cancer is a state problem, but our leaders do not take this seriously. It's a stress that affects everyone. Let treatments and good treatments be channeled to county and sub-county hospitals and for free. If we can build roads worth billions, even uh, CA treatments can be provided for all those suffering from cancer directly or indirectly. May God see you through and may the battle be easier for you to win. Gatwiri, very encouraging. And thank you. That hashtag is a new normal even as we chime in on what more needs to be done to improve the quality of life for those fighting cancer. We'll be back after a short break even as we hear from Jin in as far as her journey is concerned and also understand what more from their point of view needs to be done. We'll be right back. Malaria ni ugonjwa hatari sana unaouua watu wengi hapa Kenya. Japo kuko na corona, hatari ya malaria bado iko. Mtoto huyu alikuwa na joto jingi, kutetemeka, kuumwa na viungo na uchovu. Alikimbizwa hospitali ya umma ambako sheria za COVID-19 uzingatiwa na ni salama kwa shughuli ya upimaji. Vipimo vilionyesha kuwa ana malaria na papo hapo daktari akampa dawa za malaria na kumshauri azimalize na ili kujikinga wawe wakilala ndani ya neti iliyotibiwa. Malaria husambazwa na mbu. Walio hatarini ni watoto wa chini ya miaka tano na akina mama wajawazito. Kupimwa na kutibiwa ni bure katika hospitali zote za umma. Usisahau adui malaria. Zero malaria huanza na mimi. Chukua jukumu leo. Komesha malaria. Ujumbe huu umelizo kwenu na wizara ya afya. Fresh Fry Ginger has ginger oil which is good for a healthy living lifestyle. It combines wonderfully on salads, stir fries, when basted on roasted meat or simply sprinkled on your favorite dish. Now available in 250 ml, 500 ml and 1 liter. Akiri, 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 akiri. your hands with me I want to wash my hands with you come on I will show you what to do wash your hands wash your hands in clean water wash your hands wash your hands wet them with the water wash your hands wash your hands now add some soap scrub your hands scrub your hands in the soap and water scrub above and below between the fingers too scrub under your nails and scrub a dub a doo Rinse your hands, rinse your hands, rinse your hands in water. Rinse them clean, rinse them clean, rinse away the soap. Dry your hands, dry your hands, dry your hands and go. Akili, why do we wash our hands? To wash away the germs. Akili, what are germs? They're like tiny little bugs on your hands and they can make you sick. But I don't see any germs on my hand. That's because they're so tiny that you can't even see them. Oh, wow. I want to wash the germs away. Will you wash your hands with me, Akili? Of course!
invest in the prime plots from Finca Properties Limited, Equita Gardens Nanyuki, a gated community ready for immediate development. We also have Konza Suburbs, a gated community within Konza Metropolis. For details, call us today. Finca Properties Limited, prime and affordable. Thank you for staying with your world. My name is Gladys Gashanja. In honor of the National Cancer Survivors Month, we are celebrating the cancer heroes amongst us. And this month, just in case you did not know, it's uh, put aside to celebrate all cancer survivors and their friends and families and raise awareness of cancer and how it affects lives. Now, this might sound like a removed conversation to you because you have never experienced cancer, whether it's personally or know somebody who has, but trust you me, cancer is devastating it is with us and it is claiming a lot of lives and not only that it is also denting people's livelihoods so it is important that we keep talking about this offering hope and also putting to task the systems that be in ensuring that they give a quality of life for those who are diagnosed with cancer and speaking of which Christian Amanpur chief international anchor for CNN has been diagnosed with ovarian cancer now the CNN anchor shared her diagnosis of of ovarian cancer on her show saying she had successfully or had successful surgery and she was undergoing chemotherapy. I want to first thank Biana Goldoriga and the whole team for holding down the fort so well over the last four weeks, which have been a bit of a roller coaster for me. Because during that time, like millions of women around the world, I've been diagnosed with ovarian cancer. I've had successful major surgery to remove it and I'm now undergoing several months of chemotherapy for the very best possible long-term pro prognosis, and I'm confident. I'm also fortunate to have health insurance through work and incredible doctors who are treating me in a country underpinned by, of course, the brilliant NHS. I'm telling you this in the interest of transparency, but in truth, really mostly as a shout out to early diagnosis, to urge women to educate themselves on this disease, to get all the regular screenings and scans that you can, to always listen to your bodies, and of course, to ensure that your legitimate medical concerns are not dismissed or diminished. Very well said, because as much as we're talking about this card, we also have to take personal responsibility but not by not only listening to our bodies, but also going for early screening. Now, Jane, before we went to break, we were talking about the devastation that comes with beating cancer. And for some, it's loss of income. Now, you mentioned that when you had this, you thought death. So you started closing shop on so many things, including your PhD and Waterview. So how did you survive after? Uh, it has been a bit difficult um, uh, in that period because uh, other than closing work and uh, also my side hustles, uh, I had gone, I told you I had gone back home, but I also lost my mother two years later mm -hmm. to liver cancer. So uh, that also uh, really hit me hard. Actually, I was telling God you should have taken me, not my mom, you know, that kind of thing. So there's a lot of psychological trauma to deal with. Mm -hmm. Uh, both from your personal uh, condition, but also from the loss of uh, immediate relatives. Yes. So one thing I can say, um, uh, finances become very difficult because I had to continue. Uh, my daughter told me if I survive triple negative cancer in five years, then now I can start going slowly back to back to my normal living. Mm -hmm. But five years, it was a long time, especially after the uh, um, passing on of my mother, yeah. and of course my other one. Uh, but be something uh, came in, and because of going to India, though I sold all my two lands every year, I would have to go out sell a plot. So whatever I had saved also went. So I'd also encourage young people, when they're young, to save for mm -hmm. a later, you know, you never know about tomorrow. 
you know, we spend a lot of time with uh, going out and everything, mm -hmm. and we don't think about investing. So I'd encourage also people who are working, invest in, um, in anything that maybe you might need to dispose of. I must say that really helped me, okay. whatever little I had bought, even though now I don't have soil I can call my own, at least I have uh, my life back. Yes. Uh, in addition, uh, going to India, I learned something called uh, Ayurveda medicine. Ayurveda medicine seemed a very big word, but each year I went, I would learn. And what I learned is that it's nothing but herbs, herbs, things we have that grows in our garden. And because people who get breast cancer are given hormotherapy treatment mm -hmm. for five years or ten years, is a daily tablet. I believe Philip will explain. Maybe it's a, an oral chemotherapy to keep the cells under suppression mm -hmm. so they don't go. Because my doctor told me uh, cancer doesn't really go. I believe in God, I am healed. But uh, physically speaking, biologically speaking, even you, Gladys, you may have the cancer cells. Mm -hmm. I'm actually shocked just now to learn my mentor in media, uh, Amanpur, because she's one of those women you look up to. My profession is PR and communication. Mm -hmm. She's somebody I looked up to and to hear she's also sick. We all know that cancer doesn't choose. Mm -hmm. We've just lost Chris Girubi, many big people, you know. So it doesn't choose. Basically, what I have learned is that let's live one day at a time uh, without thinking of so much about tomorrow. COVID has also taught us, you know, I have to mm -hmm. work from the house, I have okay. to do only what I need, the basics. So let's do, I, I really don't think so much about how much, how much finances and what I'm going to eat because I really lack food. I have siblings. If I'm really stuck, I'll call my sister or my brother. But I, through the Ayurveda medicine of herbs, because I couldn't take homotherapy, I started growing herbs. Uh -huh. And as I said, because I lost my property, I have been growing it in containers on my balcony. Artemisia, um, uh, rosemary, because we get chemotherapy, chemo brain, so you need to take a lot of rosemary mm -hmm. in your tea, in your meat, in whatever you cook, and basically lemongrass, you know, because of creating an alkaline environment, yes. you know, we've, uh, we, we are told that cancer is caused by, uh, by, by a lot of acidity. So uh, that uh, lemongrass is also, uh, I've just taken my cup as uh, during the nini, you take it hot, eh? it yeah. helps to clear your systems immediately you wake up. And recently to fight COVID and also uh, malaria and any other conditions con that can come and um, compromise your immunity, I encourage to use these herbs. There, so there's nothing special about Ayurveda, it is simply using herbs what grows in our garden and what you can grow. So I have also been selling those herbs to many of my friends. Mm -hmm. I, I also recommend honey not using sugar because you know the sugar is refined and of course reduce all starches, ugari, rice and everything. And instead go green. Use a lot of greens, use a lot of uh, vegetables, all managu, saga in your cooking uh -huh. such that your plate is always half of uh, vegetables and a little protein and then a little starch just to give you enough energy uh -huh. but go more uh, change your lifestyle and then uh, change uh, to now using a lot of herbs a lot of vegetables to keep detoxing your body and and also boosting your immunity now and jane there's somebody who is asking here did you undergo a mastectomy because they can't see the breast uh, prosthesis there that was removed yes i did uh, this breast we have put my pink ribbon uh -huh. is my left breast so, but because the cancer was advanced, stage 3B, mm -hmm. it couldn't be done mastectomy immediately. Uh, the doctor had to do a lot of chemos, more than 30 sessions of radio. And then I, I, I kept having what they were being called beards. So that's one of the things I had to go to India for a PET scan. We didn't have a PET scan now. We have it in Aga Khan. But before that, I had to go every year to India to check. And every time they check, they find beards or they find another lamp under the amp, it, it is removed. So I had several surgeries before mastectomy two years later. Uh -huh. So they did remove the breast. Okay. And after they were very sure that the cancer cells had gone down. But after two years, you know women and dignity, you feel that now I've lost my breast, like she was saying she lost her arm. For me, losing my breast was bad enough. In fact, I was happy that it was go not going to be removed. But when they kept seeing something, I, it had to be removed. So I had to use these prosthesis. But this prosthesis is very expensive. It's 20, 30, 40,000 because they come from outside the country. Mm. That's why we need the government to help us with all these processes. Eh? Okay. So uh, we are teaching our women to do these ones. They are simple from wool 
And uh, so I've also been using those. But then I also had something called reconstruction. Uh, but it was part, partial, not okay. uh, complete, yeah. All right. And now yes. that you brought in the wellness, which is why the herbs come in and all that, very important, also pointing to the nutrition when it comes to surviving cancer. This is so key. Let me just quickly understand uh, both from Esther and Sydney. Esther, what have you had to change around in your diet? Of course, I had to change, like Jane has said, mm. uh, a lot of... Uh, uh, proteins you are not supposed to eat, especially the red meat, a lot of sugars, you have to avoid them. This junk food, you have to do uh, organic foods. That is the healthier way. You have to uh, avoid all these sugars in the sodas and all those juices that, that have uh, this uh, artificial sugar mm. so that you can uh, uh, be able to live a longer life and a healthier life. Okay, Sydney, men are the ones who normally have the biggest challenge when it comes to their diet. Was it difficult for you to make that shift? Well, at that point, I didn't have much of a choice. Mm. Um, also because um, of the side effects, you're throwing up a lot, you're always nauseated. Because of where my, <coughs> excuse me, Sorry. because of where my cancer was, my throat was um, affected because of the radiotherapy, so I could even swallowing water was an issue. Oh, wow. So I had to start making changes, and um, initially I was doing a lot of liquids, and uh, once I started getting better, as she said before, it's about a healthy lifestyle. There's nothing that they say you cannot eat, but they encourage you to eat healthy. Mm. Uh, staying away from fatty foods, uh, sodas and things like that, uh, just to promote a healthy lifestyle because that is one of the things that um, um, nutrition is one of the uh, biggest factors when it comes to cancer, predisposing you for cancer. So a lot of these oily foods and these things that are not good for your body, they tell you to stay away from them. Mm -hmm. And it's not just for people who have cancer. Okay, and it's true because what you're describing is actually supposed to be what we should be eating and uh, accommodating in our day-to-day -day wellness. And uh, this is also part of the psychosocial support, right? Yes, it's basically part of uh, comprehensive uh, support. Mm -hmm. and, and this is what we do at, at Faraja, you know, encouraging patients to be exercising. So we have exercise classes. We are encouraging them to eat healthy. You need to get a professional nutritionist. Don't listen to a quack nutritionist <laughs> because they'll misadvise you. They need to understand your cancer diagnosis and then give you appropriate uh, clinical nutritional advice. And then, of course, uh, yeah, just general lifestyle. But you know, Gladys, we don't have to wait until somebody is diagnosed with cancer. Mm. It's something that we can start early. You can start now. You know, eating healthy, I don't have to wait. You know, I can start now. I can start eating healthy right now mm -hmm. yes and i hope we are all taking this in because at the end of the day they say scientifically we all have cancerous cells is as for some they actually develop into becoming now the disease so take on your wellness well remember that hashtag again is new normal even as we hear from you what more needs to be done to improve the quality of life for those fighting cancer and as i mentioned i'd like to hear from also our panelists what they think needs to be done let me start off with esther for you you have had to be amputated that means you literally had to learn using your left hand right yes okay how was that and uh, what has it taught you about yourself uh, this was the most difficult thing to deal with uh, apart from uh, knowing that you have cancer you are told that this this hand has to go you have to live without your arm Remember, you are using that arm. You have to learn now to use the other arm. It was really devastating. And uh, I think a lot of information out there mm. should be given so that people should know how to deal with the, the loss of a limb and how to adapt with their, how to adapt with their life mm. now because that is a new lifestyle you have to deal with. And also to, to know how to... Uh, access those processes because like me now I have I don't even have a shoulder now I I really need a prosthesis sh shoulder because I cannot live my life without a shoulder before I was amputated the shoulder I could live that way because 
I could wear my clothes normally. Mm -hmm. Now I have to tie my, my, my bra because the cloth is falling. Mm -hmm. So, and the processes are very expensive. So I think the, even the government should do something about the, maybe subsidizing the cost of the processes and also making them accessible out there that people can access them even without paying or maybe paying a small amount of money. Uh -huh. And uh, to that question I also asked, with all the changes and you beating every single obstacle along the way, what have you learned about Esther? I believe I've learned um, I'm a very strong girl. I never knew how strong I am until even recently when I, the recurrence of cancer came back because I, I thought it was done and I was done with cancer. It was not coming back again. But now in 2019, uh, around November, I had to now start over again and thinking now, what is this? I thought this, is, was, this was over. Mm -hmm. Now I, I believe I'm a very strong girl and I'm out here to give hope and even to encourage others, even those people who think now uh, this cannot be done or even this is done, I'm now going to die. Uh, to tell them that it is possible and uh, as long as you, you, you accept the situation as it is and even seek, in, seek the right information out there because there is a lot of information out there that is fake. Mm. People are really targeting especially the cancer uh, patients because they know we are desperate. We can do anything even to, to, to uh, maybe get healed or maybe get the treatment. So there is a lot of information out there that is not right so people should seek the right information from the hospitals and even to follow what the doctors are saying because cancer is not even choosing whether you are white or black or mm -hmm. a child or anybody. Anybody can get cancer. Even the doctors themsel themselves, they are, they're even getting affected or even infected. This is a tragedy and we have to deal with it as it is and we have to make sure that we, we go through the right channels and not even go out there seeking the propagandas. Uh -huh. And for you, Sydney, what did you learn about yourself through that journey of beating nasal cancer? I resonate with what Esther says. Cancer pushes you to your limits. You start to realize who you are. And once you get over that hurdle of um, thinking that maybe I'm not going to make it or this thing, I can't beat it, you get to a level where you realize that no challenge is insurmountable. Whatever the outcome, you wake up every day and you decide to fight. And that defines who you are. I wouldn't be who I am today had I not gone through cancer. Oh. And what I would encourage people who have gone through cancer is to share their stories, because your story is your most, personal, your most powerful tool. Mm. Uh, raising awareness, giving people hope, one of the re ways I'm doing this is by climb climbing Mount Kenya with a group of survivors to prove that we are still here. We still awesome. have post-cancer challenges, but we are doing the best we can. And we are going to summit Mount Kenya in September through the Kelele Challenge. And just ge getting the word out there that cancer is not a death sentence. Yeah. It can be beaten and life can go on after cancer. Amen to that and thank you for being such a loud advocate of the same. And Jane, what is that one thing that you've learned about yourself through this journey? I've learned that uh, uh, education can be done in many ways. I don't always have to do chalk and board. Yes. So I've been using uh, different platforms to educate and uh, I'm really passionate about uh, ensuring that other patients survive because really when you are told it's a death sentence and those of us, as you have seen, have survived, it's not really a death sentence. We just need a positive attitude. That's what I would like people to know. And uh, we're actually trying to form different groups for survivors in their different settlements, because especially uh, since COVID, we learned that we cannot 
uh, visit always. So following the government's Nyumbakumi initiative, so we've tried to form different groups of cancer survivors. We have the Ushindi can cancer survivor, Waiyakiwe Kangemi. There is also Dandora. They have their own symbol of hope. Uh, and, and the Mididada. You know, with uh, like 12 to 30 people, it's easy to manage them and take to them support food. And then we have also got NHIF uh, from the leaders because they know those who are most vulnerable. So that kind of uh, cell groups uh, is one of the things we are, we are doing at the moment. And then we also managed to get a lot of food, cereals and everything, but I felt that they need also these vegetables, the greens. Mm. So we've been trying to encourage them to plant uh, vegetables, but those who can't in the informal set settlements, we are trying to help them uh, set up vegetable gardens. And we really need uh, people support, cooperate, because it's quite expensive you need to use special materials because now you can only use a little space so that kind of uh, kind of education but also lobbying uh, the government mm -hmm. uh, we have a larger cancer survivors association of Kenya I'm the secretary and we've been lobbying the government we've been doing petitions every year we've actually had to work sometimes the government needs a mass of people mm -hmm. so together with the cancer survivors with Kenco uh, members, I'm sure also from Faraja join us. Uh, we, every other time, especially this month, that's what we were doing, lobbying. Um, and then in addition to that, we are encouraging people to take advantage of what every support group is doing. For example, Sydney with the children, that parents with children are, are able to align themselves yeah. with Hope for Cancer Kids, the Aga Khan Victoria support group, and at the same time, Faraja, which has been very helpful to many of us. Like for me, I got what is called lymphodemia, so I go there periodically for lymphatic drainage, because if you notice, maybe one time we'll arrange, I can bring you women more than 10, their hands are so swollen. Mm -hmm. And I know three women who have died from complications of uh, that limb. When your breast is removed, they also remove the nodes where there is uh, uh, flow. Yeah. yeah. So those are some of the things that we are doing. But now, me, I just want to encourage the government to prepare educational materials. Really, cancer is become, it should be a national disaster. Mm -hmm. And if they managed with HIV to make it free, and we have so many HIV survivors, I believe we can still have more cancer survivors once they are educated mm -hmm. and they are told go for screening early, go and, 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 and um, be checked and keep checking. And if it is in your family, then all other members of the family could be at risk because some cancers are genetic. And then at the same time, they also ensure that there is this improvement of both human and physical resources, human through education in the universities of oncology students. We have our Aga Khan University. They are doing a lot for cancer. I'm sure there's something at Ken, but we have few doctors. The oncologists are mm -hmm. really so few uh, in relation to the patients. So the government could encourage more people to study oncology, medical, radiotherapy, and so forth while All at the right. same time install uh, more radiotherapy machines such that when I go, I'm not being told I have to wait a year before I do radio after surgery. The cancer will continue spreading. Thank yeah, you, thank, thank you. you, thank you, Jane, and we celebrate you, and definitely, Philip, you have been walking this journey with so many patients year in, year out. Your parting shot. Uh, my parting shot is, number one, we are all candidates. So we need to really take care of our life, live a healthy lifestyle. Don't wait until you're diagnosed. Number two, 80 to 90 percent of cancer cases in this country are diagnosed at late stage. Mm -hmm. So we really need to go for screening. Don't wait for October, Breast Cancer Month, to go for screening. And then number three, um, the government. I think there's a lot, there's more that is, there, there's something that is happening, but I think there's more that we can do. There's only two uh, public radiotherapy facilities in the country at Kenyatta National Hospital at, and Kenyatta Teaching and Referral Hospital. Mm -hmm. I know the government can do more so that we don't have people coming from Mombasa for treatment in Nairobi. All these centers are located in Nairobi. Mm -hmm. So I think the government can decentralize uh, radiotherapy uh, treatment facilities in the counties. And then number four, uh, NHIF, they're, they're, they've been doing some work but there's more work that can be done because it's really helped many people, but there's more uh, that can be done. And the last one is thank you very much for <laughs> giving us this opportunity just to come and share. For the cancer survivors who are out there, you are heroes of hope. Don't lose hope. Uh, we are there to support you. Faraja Cancer Support Trust is there to support you. 
Kenya network of cancer organizations is there to support you. Many organizations are really trying to see how they can support cancer survivors. So reach out, don't isolate yourself. Reach out to these organizations and get that support that you need. Thank now, you. Now, Philip, before you even finish, somebody is saying, speak to the caregivers because they walk this journey too with the survivors. Thank you for highlighting that. Uh, definitely, caregivers, sometimes what we call caregiver burden. Mm. The caregivers sometimes even struggle more than the patient in some cases. So for the caregivers who are out there, you are heroes. I really want to salute you. I want to support you uh, for the work that you're doing, trying to figure out how to help the patient. And uh, you know, patients have different needs and really figuring out these needs. Reach out again uh, for Raja Cancer Support Trust. We have a caregivers support group. And I know other organizations also have caregivers support group. Come together, share your experiences and support each other. We can win when we unite. Thank Very you. well said. Philip Odio, psycho-oncologist at the Faraja Cancer Support Trust, is also the director representing Africa at International Psycho-Oncology Society, EPOS. Jane Frances Angalia, who is a triple negative breast cancer survivor, seven years on. Esther Nyambura Gitao, bone cancer survivor, 14 years on. Sydney Chahonyo, who is a nasal cancer survivor, 16 years on. We celebrate you and thank you for coming on to this uh, platform to give hope to others that are wearing your shoes and those that are also caring for them. Now, tomorrow, let me start off with the fact that on the 23rd of June is International Women in Engineering Day. Now, here on Your World, we shall celebrate these trailblazers tomorrow as they share their journey, challenges, and successes in this male-dominated industry. See you from 7 a.m.